Nation, the community of Christ Church, and I'm also the grandfather of Sean. And I'm not sure I'll be able to get through this very easily, but I'm sure going to try. And I know you're all feeling the same way. And uh, it's a sad occasion. It's a time when we're all going to be mourning. But it's also a time when we do want to celebrate the life of Sean Daniel Lamb. And uh, he wasn't here on this earth very many years, but during the time he was here, he made a name for himself and he made an impression on a lot of people. So if you would, please bow with me while I'll the word of prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, it is my prayer that you will look down upon this group of people and bless them with your spirit of love and concern. Concern for the loss of our beloved son, grandson, brother, nephew, uncle, cousin, and friend so many. A loved one who has been a part of each of their lives for many years. And love for all who will remain on this earth and who will always remember Sean for so many things that he has accomplished over such a short lifetime. I ask, Father, that you will help us all to remember and be able to share the many times that he has touched each one here. Father, help us all to know that you are always with us and will continue to guide us through your Holy Spirit and through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name I offer this prayer. Amen. I'd like to begin by sharing a little bit about Sean. He was born to Daniel and Sidney Lee Lang on April 30th, 1982. He was born at the Lake County East Hospital in Paintonville, Ohio. He was alone without any other siblings until his brother Gregory was born on July 16th, 1984. Sean and Gregory were great brothers. They always played together. Sean seemed to be the smarter of the two, as my wife Joy and I watched them together. We took a lot of time with them, spent time with them, and watched them grow. And some of the silly things they used to do just made us made our day. But they were good boys. We never had any trouble at all. He started school at Cedar Brook Elementary in Banks. After about a year, he and his parents moved to Mentor, Mentor, where he continued his elementary schooling at the Center Street Elementary School. As he continued to grow, he and his brother Gregory spent much time together playing with Lincoln Logs, Legos, Erector Sets, and their favorite, Tonka Toys. They would play for hours out in the backyard under an oak tree. Sean and Gregory spent a lot of time at our home on Hart Street in Menor because their mom and dad were working during the day. But they were never any trouble to us, and we enjoyed every day with them. When Sean started middle school at Ridge Junior High, he became interested in many things, many different things. Because he loved his brother very much. They, they were good friends. 
But uh, <clears throat> let me go on and share this. First of all, my brother Sean Daniel, he was a very intelligent man. He was a loving brother in his own way. I lost touch with Sean for many years after I joined the military, and that still bothers me to this day, that we couldn't have been in better contact with each other. However, I'm going to talk to you about some of the things that were wonderful about Sean that most don't know. Like my mother, Sean was a very artistic young man. He enjoyed music at a young age. However, he loved music most young children wouldn't even listen to today. He loved listening to classical music by the age of 10 and would sit in his bedroom playing video games <coughs> listening to Mozart. And that's one of the reasons why we played the music that we did on the came and we'll be playing it again when we leave. But I, I really didn't know this about Sean, that he loved music that much, especially Mozart. Yeah. Yeah. But anyhow, this, feel, this fueled Sean's passion for music and his intellect. His mother, Cindy Lee, and Aunt Tanya shared their love of music with Sean, and they connected on an emotional level together for music. My mother knew this about Sean, and as soon as he expressed his interest in learning how to play music on a guitar, she took him to the music shop to pick out his first guitar. Sean wanted an electric acoustic guitar. My uncle Doug and cousin Corey <coughs> were very influential in helping Sean choose the right style, as Uncle Doug is musically talented and shared his love of music with all of us kids. He helped Sean pick the right platform to get started playing guitar. My father and mother saved and bought Sean his first guitar. I remember the day he bought it home. I couldn't bear to listen to the noise of him learning how to do it. He was trying to tune it on his own, and he was also trying to learn how to read music, but he came around and played very well. Sean's artistic passion for music grew the older he ate. He made lifelong friends in high school due to his artistic side, while also playing football. And he met Anthony Tuardi and John Dobb, who would jam with him on a regular basis, even forming their own band, playing in our Aunt Terry and Uncle Doug's empty barn. On one particular day, I came home from school and Sean had been playing for a few years by now, and him and his friend Anthony were out on the balcony at Deepwood Apartments by the Menor Mall. They sat out there with their guitars and amplifiers, playing anything from Metallica to Pearl Jam, rocking away on their guitars, entertaining the neighborhood, whether the neighbors wanted it or not. While our father was away at work, this was happening. I sat and listened to them jam, and I started to become more influenced by Sean and my mother's love of music. Sean knew, I too. Sean knew that I too started to love the type of music he was into, and he took me to my first concert to see the Red Hot Chili Peppers <laughs> when we were teenagers. The next concert we both went to was on our bucket list together. We went to Cleveland, and he paid for my ticket to see Pearl Jam because he knew how big of a fan I was along with him. This is probably the hardest thing to write in my entire life to date. I loved my brother. We shared a lot of wonderful memories together. Our dad, Uncle Dan, Uncle Doug, taught us how to fish, and camp, and ride bikes, box, and work on cars. Growing up, Sean found the world buzzing about computers, and he took an interest in this. He asked our father if we could have one. And Sean said, I can build it, Dad. <laughs> and so our father agreed, and Sean built his first computer. 
And you know, as I read this, I kind of remember when he said he was going to do that. I go, yeah, oh, sure, yeah, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> but he really did. This was the beginning of his computer engineer career, path before he even knew it. Sean also was an outdoorsman. And after high school, he got a job working for our cousin Dayton Eckers in the summer working at Temple Grove as Dayton's helper in keeping our grounds for worship in excellent condition. Sean loved to camp, fish, hike, and bike as a teenager and up into his 20s. He rode motorcycles and started developing software to battle cancer for hospitals in Phoenix, Arizona. In his off time while working a full-time job designing blueprint software, he was a master computer programmer. So much so, in college he would help his fellow students by writing programs for them, earning extra cash to help get him through his college years. Our father and my grandfather Bill first taught us what hard work was. And Sean worked very hard all his life without fail. From digging post holes and throwing hay on our grandpa Lang's farm, which he wasn't thrilled about, <laughs> to designing software to improve efficiencies for Amazon warehouses worldwide as the chief software engineer for Amazon's warehouse division that he has developed a way you all currently get your Amazon packages. Sean was loved by all. He was introverted, but he made friends with everyone along the way. I will cherish our memories together, and I know he is well today, resting above us all, with our mother, smiling down on this service. Sean's life changed drastically when he moved to Seattle. His love of life seemed to fade away, but maybe that was God's way of saying it was his time to go. We will never know. Death has plagued our family in the recent years, and I hope this is the last pain we all have to feel for a while. God knows we need a break. Finally, I want to thank you all again for coming today. I will leave you with this message. <coughs> Sean's death was tragic. We will never know if it was preventable. The details are not important, but if you know anything, anyone struggling <coughs> in any way, help them now. Do what you can to help them. Lord knows my father and I tried. We lost another beautiful mind who was changing the world we currently live in and for the future. Sean will not be forgotten. And our memories of him will never be lost. Thank you. John's brother, Gregory Lang. I'm so glad that Sean Gregory sent me that letter. It made my job a lot easier here. But it also gave him the opportunity to share with you how much love he and his brother had for each other. And I know that they, I know that they missed each other because for the past 16 years now, Gregory's been in the service, right? Dan? Yeah, 17 years. And the other time, Sean was in Seattle or Arizona, and he was building up himself to be whatever he was destined to be. And he did a wonderful job of it. Sean became very good at what he did. And he helped the people at Amazon to develop some pretty interesting things. And I know we're all going to miss him. And I, I just, I, I think to myself all the time how, how Sad it is that we're losing so many young people today. And I don't know why that is. But something's going wrong. And that's what Gregory was talking about when he said, if you know somebody that's in trouble, help them. If it just seems like they might be in trouble, ask them, talk to them, see what you can do to help them.
I want to continue by letting others, my youth folks, share some of the testimonies that you have about Sean. But before we do that, we have a very special treat for everyone here, but especially for Sean. Anthony Tuardi, who I mentioned in my story, to a great extent, grew up with Sean, and he and Sean and some other friends played music together, as you just heard from Greg's work. Anthony is going to sing a song that he wrote in memory of his buddy Sean. That song is called
As we gather here in front of Sean, I want to share something else that Jesus said. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. I now share it with you so that you will know that Sean has also taken the hand of Jesus and crossed over from this world into the next where he will be with all his loved ones who have gone before him. It is true that Sean is no longer with us on this earth, but it is also true that we all have memories of him, and we will remember all the times that he and we were together, good times and bad times. But through it all, life moved on, and each one here today will remember those times. Up until this point, I've been doing all the talk. And at this time, I want to open the service up to give you the opportunity to share testimonies of Sean or his family or anything else that you remember about him. And I know how difficult it might be for some to do this in front of a group or just to talk, but I know you can do it. And the Lord will be with you, so at this point I'm going to ask who might be first to share a testimony. Dan, would you like to use the microphone there? Talk to me. It doesn't matter. You got a big mouth there, buddy. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> <Nice. laughs> Cindy and I lost our boy to a terrible thing. As Bill said, if you know anybody needs help, you know, the drug addiction. I lost my sister last summer also to drug addiction. Please try to help them at least, you know. We try. Unfortunately, um, I had to see Sean at probably the worst point of his life. And it haunts, it, it, it haunts you because you want to help, you know, you want to try to, um, try to change things. Sean was such a, a, a caring, loving young man. I mean, he would do anything for anybody that needed help. Uh, and if you needed him, he was, Sean was always there. I try to think of Sean as this, you know, just the little boy that uh, Bill was talking about <laughs> when he was 10 years old. He came up to me and he said, Dad, he said, I'd, uh, I'd like to get some new music. And I said, okay, what do you want, you know? He says, well, I'd like to get some Mozart, <laughs> Beethoven, and 
found some guy that was putting together PCs in his garage, you know, and it was a reasonable price, and I said, come on, John, get in the car, and kept, I didn't tell him what we were doing, and we walked into this fellow's garage, and he could, his, his, his eyes just got that big, you know, the biggest smile I've ever seen on his face, I said, pick one out, and then, you know, let's have at it, and he picked one out, and he, that was Sean's John's life. He, he knew from that moment on what he was going to do. And he was very good at it. Good. But uh, he would listen to that Mozart and he'd drive us nuts. <laughs> <laughs> he and John me and Greg were like, oh, you know, here's that Mozart, here comes Beethoven or whatever, you know. And he, in that little that little room out to the year old office there. Oh, was that right? Yeah. <laughs> and he he learned how to write software in that room by himself. He, he self taught himself. And uh, I was very fortunate uh, with both my sons. They, they both had direction. They knew what they were going to do with their lives. Uh, and that that's a that's a fortunate thing for a father or a mother to look at and see. Yeah. So, unfortunately, his life took a turn in Seattle. And uh, that Sean that I lived with for two months up there uh, wasn't the same Sean. And uh, it wasn't his. It was, as I say, it wasn't his fault, but it's just the drugs take over the brain, you know, and, 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 they, take, and they change people. Uh, but Sean still had love in his heart. He still would help anybody that, you know, walked in the door and said, I need some help, Sean, you know, I need this, or, or just the, the kindest heart I ever, I ever knew in my life. And his brother's the same way, Greg's the same way. So. I'm a, I'm a very blessed man to have known Sean and lived with him for almost 37 years. I wrapped it up nice and <laughs> put a good knot in it for you.
Sean's great aunt, and uh, I was fortunate to be a part of Sean's life in his early years, as you see uh, from the pictures here and the poster pictures. And um, his uncle Dan and I and our boys, Dayton and George, uh, we shared a, a family together. They were just like two more boys in our family as they grew up. Um, Sean, and in his early years when um, they were young and they were in um, our congregation in Painesville, we had a congregation there. And we had a dear lady by the name of Bee Harnish and uh, she loved working with the youth. And uh, Sean and Greg were always willing to participate in any activity that was going on in the congregation. Uh, they were in plays together. Uh, they did mime uh, performances in our congregation. And they were very appreciative and always willing to accept a, a responsibility to do and speak. Uh, and most kids are shy and backwards about that, but the boys weren't. Sean and Greg were just right in there uh, doing whatever they could do. Uh, one of the, the <coughs> fun things we did one time was get together on a Saturday and we made kites. And Sean was just a little guy. He wasn't more than seven years old, I would say. And um, Sean made his kite. We went across the street to fly him. And Sean had the hardest time getting his kite up in the air. And um, I went with him, and we just we had to run. And he just ran his little legs off trying to get that kite up in the air. And it finally went. We finally got it up there. So that was a successful thing that he did. The boys were a joy to have around our home and um, do activities with our family. And uh, I'm, I'm so fortunate. And um, you know, I'm sad too because, like Greg said, um, over the years when Sean moved away from this area, our contact with him was less. And we didn't get to see him as much in his 20s, late 20s, and early 30s. We didn't get to see him as much but we knew that he was always in our hearts and our thoughts. And uh, when people would ask me what Sean did, I never knew exactly what he did, but I always just called him the computer wizard because that was something that was kind of incorporated everything into one. He was a wizard with the computers. And um, Sean uh, came to our home when my husband passed away, his uncle Dan, just about a year ago when we got to see him. And uh, Sean sat at our kitchen table doing his computer work because he had to do a business call. And uh, we had to be quiet because he was on the computer. And then later, um, Sean realized that we had an old stereo in our living room that we've had for years since we've been married. And uh, he got me. I didn't realize that he was really into that kind of music. And he was so excited. He went through all the records that he could go through and pull out the ones that he wanted to take back on the plane. And he had a whole bag full of them. I don't know how he did it. And he got them back home without breaking, he said. So that was a nice experience to share with him on that, that day. And uh, I so appreciated him being able to come and be with us because um, he meant a lot to his Uncle Dan. And, um, he helped Dan do things around the house, and he was just a, a blessing, for sure. And I, I would just like to read to you something from this book that it's funny how the Lord puts things in your path when you're looking for something. And as I was doing the poster, I was going through a lot of pictures that I had, and a lot of our pictures are, are, are all out there. And I came across this devotional book, and I came across this one poem that kind of meant something very special to me, but I wanted to share it with everyone so it would mean give everyone here comfort in, 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 in that. It's called Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled. Whenever I am troubled and lost in deep despair, I bundle all my troubles up and go to God in prayer. I tell him I am heart sick and lost and lonely too that my mind is deeply burdened and I don't know what to do. But I know he still the toughest and calm the angry sea. And I humbly ask if in his love he'll do the same for me. 
And then I just keep quiet and think only thoughts of peace. And if I abide in stillness, my restlessness murmuring, murmurs cease. I am John's grandmother. I had nine grandsons and one granddaughter. John was second oldest, and I would have the boys, the first four boys, come and spend time with me every summer, and sometimes on their spring break even. And those boys had more fun and got into more trouble <laughs> when they were at my house. But I enjoyed them so much. And then I lost touch. I was able to get to Sean's uh, college graduation, which I was so proud of. And I was proud of all my grandchildren. But Sean was kind of separate. He was a higher proud to me than the rest. He was so knowledgeable. And, and he did so much with his life. And I bragged about him quite a bit. I, I should have bragged more about my other two grandkids, but he was the one I bragged about the most. And he's going to be the one I'm going to miss the most. John's Aunt Terry, and this is a hard thing to do, and it's going to be very emotional. I forgot what tissue, but um, um, I'm just going to ask that you be patient with me if I pause, and if I turn red, it's just my hot flashes. I'm okay, <laughs> but I would like to follow up on what Greg ended with and what Dan ended with, and the concern of concern of Bill. So. I also may never know why this happened to Sean. Thank you. I mean, the real underlying reason of why this happened to Sean, what was going on. And I have regrets about Sean. I do. I learned a lesson, and that is to be more involved and more in touch with my loved ones and to listen to my own intuition. I am learning the warning signs of those struggling in these circumstances. They will draw away from family and friends. If anyone sees this happening in their family unit or their circle of friends, like Greg said, you know, reach out to them. Do something to the best of your ability because doubt can immobilize you. It did for me. Another lesson I learned is not all will accept help. Some are so trapped in this deep pit of enslavement Yet we can still throw them a lifeline. Granted, some might not want to grab on, yet some may reach out for help. And as far as I'm concerned, I would rather have them angry with me for the rest of their life than be alive. But this is Sean, our Sean. And I would call him Shawnee Boy. That was his nickname for me. And when Dan and Boyd lived across the street one day, Sean comes walking over to the house. I would say he was probably about 11. And he said, Aunt Terry, I need to make some money. You may not even know about this. <laughs> so I took him out and I showed him this huge shrub I had. 
And I said, okay, you can shake this up. I give him a little clippers that he'll be safe with. He can go in the house and eventually he completes his mission, comes in and gets me, go out and look at this sh the shrub. The shrub was this size. And Sean had done such a good job, the shrub was this size. <laughs> and I was a surprise. I was surprised about that, but I didn't say anything because I said, he was proud of the work that he had done and he did get a paycheck. <laughs> but here we are now. Who would have believed this? And I'm still in shock and deeply hurt and sad as I know you all are. So, how do we deal with this grief? missing our Sean. Where do we go for help? For my part, anyone who believes in the Creator knows that this book, the Bible, is our, is, is our instructional manual for our lives. And who would know us better than our Creator? I have found through my own personal study of the Bible that our Heavenly Father Jehovah addresses this issue that we're all struggling with right now here today, the death of a loved one. How does God address this? Jehovah, as Bill has said, sent his son Jesus to earth to show us that Jesus was given the power to resurrect the dead. Not only to heaven, but to also right here on earth. How do we know that? Well, listen to what just one scripture says, in part in John chapter 5. This is a very powerful piece of information that each and every one of us should know about. Jesus tells us, Do not be amazed. The hour is coming in which all those in their memorial tombs or graves will hear his voice and come out or rise up. Those to a resurrection of judgment and those to a resurrection of life. All those in their graves. This is what gives me hope. To see Sean again one day, to wrap my arms around him with tears of joy instead of tears of sorrow. What a loving Heavenly Father we have. Jehovah is giving all our dead loved ones a second chance in life. So I hope this Bible promise can bring you some degree of peace and comfort as it has for myself. And to embrace the wonderful hope for the future and being reunited with not only Sean, but all our dead loved ones again. Thank you very much, Barry. Are there others? So, me and John are best, we're basically best friends in high school. It was pretty cool. Uh, I remember meeting and playing football in seventh grade. We were, we were going to talk about football, you know, sort of terribly good at that time. But uh, yeah. we were talking about video games, waiting for our folks to come get us after practice, and talking about playing Final Fantasy 2 or 3 or some, some kind of something that I really wanted. And, uh, you know, I was just kind of bonding, bonding over that. And uh, I don't know, Sean was just always one of my best friends growing up. He was, he was one of those guys who could be awkward around girls with and, you know, hashed our clever plan to, you know, start a band so we could pick up some dates and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know still what we were doing. But, uh, yeah, Chuck Sun tonight. Um, Sean had that awesome unibrow. Yeah. My assumption is I was in those same shoes. Um, I don't know, we were just a bunch of awkward kids back then. But uh, I do remember how stinking smart that kid was. I remember we did our, took our testing when we were going into college. And I can't remember if we had a 33 or a 31 on that, on that ACT. I just remember it was two points higher than mine. I was like, God. <laughs> <laughs> like, 33. You know, 33. Yeah. There it is. He was a smart dude. I thought I was a pretty smart dude, but he was smarter than I was. He went to Cleveland State, and I remember <laughs> hanging out with him and all his Japanese girlfriends and all that stuff. And that was, those were some pretty hilarious times. I remember he shows up one day and he's married all of a sudden. He's like, guys, we're, we're playing Dungeons and Dragons on a Sunday. And he shows up and he's like, you guys missed your spot checks. I'm like, what are you talking about? And it's before everybody's wearing platinum bands and all that, and he had one. I'm like, what the heck is this black ring on your finger? He got, got married.
Yeah, it lasts too long, but just, I don't know, it's just the kind of guy, it surprised me out of nowhere, just the craziest stuff. Um, but yeah, it wasn't for Sean, I don't know, I don't know if I would have made it through, through school, wouldn't have, had, wouldn't have had friends, wouldn't have had some of these bonds, and uh, probably would have played music the way that I went to, ended up doing, I mean, I met, met Doug and Pat, and even when we were terrible, and we were terrible. They were like, no, come to this open mic and play, it's okay, you know, we'll clap and we'll cheer for you anyways, and they encourage you to do all that stuff. And, I don't know, I miss that guy. I also regret not keeping up with him after he moved out of town, but, you know, that's, that's how these things go, I guess. That's okay, he's in my heart, and, uh, I don't know, he's in my Thanks, Andrew. <clears throat> but he was more of a brother to me. <clears throat> and then a uh, great letter, you know, it was he said in there that uh, he he worked with me down in Delta Grove, our church campground. But we weren't really close there because I had to be the boss. <laughs> so he was more the worker and not the cousin or brother. But uh, one of the things, that we did, we had a common. We, uh, we both liked Star Trek. And we got to go to the same convention together. Just the two of us. And just that short time being together like that meant a lot. And uh, he lived with us for a moment. Him and his brother lived with us, hopping on throughout the years. And. Uh, um, Greg, uh, again, he, he's, he's more of a brother. In fact, we went through uh, basic training in the Air Force at pretty much the same time, which was kind of cool. But, uh, Sean will always be here, and uh, now he's going to be able to see the stars like no one, none of us can.
My strongest memory, Sean, was the summer of 96 or 97 when I had all of them, Sean, Greg, and their cousin Corey with us for the summer. I was managing a trailer park at the time, and uh, we had an abandoned trailer there that had to be just taken apart so it could be towed away. And on the first day of the job, I had three strong workers there. Sean looks at things and he steps back and he says, well, you know, Grandpa, we need to do it this way. And I listened to him tell me how to take that place apart because he looked at it and saw the way it was put together. I knew at that time he was going to succeed in whatever he tried to do. Thank you. Thank you. second shift and, and he was up and waiting. Yeah, he'd come and hang out and we'd do all kinds of fun stuff. But him and his brother would take my dog out on the rollerblades and take him for a walk. <laughs> I don't know who was walking who, the dog or the kids were walking in. But they enjoyed that, that was fun. And uh, one time he'd come down and he had kidney infection or kidney stones or something like that. He was prone like his dad. And, uh, so was my sister and I, his, his mom, well, we got to go to the springs and get you some spring water because that's, that's the best kind of water and you need to drink a lot of it. So we passed this thing. Well, the springs are no longer there. Um, but we, we did. We went and got gallons of water for him. So he drank that special spring water. And uh, he did get better, you know, but I don't think it's because of the water. <laughs> we tried. And he took a trip with me down to Georgia uh, to get my stuff. I lived there for a month. And uh, he was a real trooper. Took a ride on the bus, long ride on the bus. And he kind of constipated and so I says, well, let me get you some laxatives. And you know, he's like, okay. So we found him some laxatives and he took them. And I think the next stop that we made on that bus, he went and he was in that bathroom for a while. <laughs> he come out and he says, I'll never eat corn on the cob again. <laughs> as long as I live, I will never touch corn on the cob again. <laughs> Yeah. And I was like, oh, dude, I'm so sorry that <laughs> that happened, you know. But uh, so we get to Georgia, and we had to run a U-Haul and stuff. And uh, I says, well, I got this grandmother clock here, and I, I got I to gotta tie it somehow. We ain't got no rope. And this is like 3 o'clock in the morning we're doing this. I says, well, we gotta, we got to run up to Walmart. So him and I went into Walmart and he's like, people are gonna wonder why we're getting rope at this time in the morning. And I says, well, <laughs> we laughed about it. And then he seen a Stephen King book. And uh, he's like, can, he, can I get that? I said, sure, you could, yeah, get that book. Something for you to read on the way home. So he did. He was such a cool kid. And, uh, 
He helped us out a lot over at Tom's house. Getting her ready to rent. He's a, a lot of uh, trim. He did an excellent job staying in all the trim. Uh, and he helped out a lot. He was, uh, when he was a little boy, I do recall him, uh, when he would eat his food, he would sit there and go, Eat his food. Just love to eat his food, you know. <coughs> and, uh, Donuts. <laughs> he was uh, so special. Uh, gonna miss him. Thought I missed him before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna really miss him. This is hugs. at us here, you know. That's what we always have to say. Think of that face. Hold it dear in your hearts. But never forget them. And I love you, Sean Daniel. Thank you. I'm Grandma, too. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I remember when John was born, I went to the hospital oh. to see him. And the nurse wouldn't let me hold him, wouldn't let me take him and put him down and sit down with him. And she wouldn't allow that because she was afraid I'd drop him. <laughs> <laughs> and um, But I finally did. And, get to hold him, and his little eyes were just going back and forth. So that little brain of his that God gave him was very special. And he used that brain that God gave him. And um, he used to like to get into my uh, little drawer that I had in the kitchen. And I had all my little cans of spices in there. Well, he loved to get in those little cans and take them out. And that's the only problem I ever had with him and his brother. They, they would come over to the house and you never know their little boys were around. They were such good little boys. But uh, Sean had patience. He was a very patient person. And uh, I can remember him helping his brother with his homework. And Gregory is very smart, but Sean was smarter. <laughs> and where he got the braids at? How did he get those braids? I don't know where he got the braids. His father, I understand, is uh, smart. His mother got strays in college, and so I, I think he had parents that were pretty smart. We'll give it to mom. Yeah. But anyway, um, Sean was always, uh, he liked to be busy, and uh, I can remember him getting in, helping grandma get the clothes out of the dryer. And, um, He'd almost climb into the dryer <laughs> to get them, because you know they some of the clothes get in the back and you can't reach them. And uh, he loved to do that. And there was a little what did they call them? Little, um, they were very popular. Little boys used to like to ride them, and they would they. Oh, the tricycles, the big wheels, big, big wheels, big wheels, or something like that. Well, we had a driveway that went downhill, just right. so slightly, and he just loved to ride on that thing. That's, the, that's probably where he got his love the motorcycles. <laughs> and he used to get, and our neighbor next door complained about the noise of him <laughs> riding down sure. there. And so we had to kind of cool it. But anyways, he liked to do that, and 
I just had so many fond memories of, of Sean when he was little, and he always wanted to be a cook. He did. He liked that cook. He did. And that's something that he, he was a good cook. I thought he was going to be a chef. He was a good I cook. I really yeah. did. But uh, anyway, um, he um, would come home from <coughs> school, him and Gregory, and they'd come racing in the house, and the first thing they would do was get the box where the Legos were. Oh, yeah. And they clear, we'd clear off the coffee table, and they would play with those Legos, and they just had a blast, <laughs> just had a blast. And they work and work and work and work and work with those Legos. <laughs> And until uh, they had something built. And it was so cute, I could still see them doing that. And Sean had a hard time in school as far as bullying went, because he was so smart. And um, I remember I used to have to go pick him up, him and his brother, because the kids were so bad. And uh, so he had some tough times in his life that he had to go through because he was very pudgy when, when he was little. <laughs> and I can remember Bill and I were snowbirds and we came home and Sean was at the house. They stayed at our house during that time. And uh, we came in and my gosh, here little Sean was, had grown. And people told me I wouldn't recognize him. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't have recognized him because he was always so pudgy. And here he grew and grew. And he had a mustache. Now, this was very young. I used to call my little old man because he was my little old man. He was just, he was for his age, you know. But anyway, he shaved off his mustache, and I can remember his dad coming in and saying, oh no, <laughs> you didn't wait for me, and his dad was looked out, <laughs> he was looked out. But anyway, I, I have so many fond memories of uh, Sean, and it's so good to see uh, so many people here today, because he's been gone for a long time. And uh, it's just, it hits my soul. And I just love everybody. And Sean is, is just wonderful to have memories that you can remember. And um, carry those on the rest of your life is so wonderful. And I'm so fortunate that I still have my mind about me. Um, 86 years old now, and I'm moving. I'm moving. The Lord's moving me. <laughs> and um, He is with me. And, and uh, like Terry said, you know, the Lord is so important to all of us. And we thank you for Sean. And thank you for the memories that we have of him. And thank you again for coming. Thank you, Joy. Well, I don't know if there's anybody else. Um, if there isn't, um, I'd just like to tell you that I, I miss this young man as well. I know that he's in a far better place now. And, uh, he's touched a lot of lives over the 36 years that he was on this earth. And uh, I just pray that we can never forget him and all the things that he's done and accomplished. So at this time, before we close, uh, Anthony is going to do one more song for us. Uh, our uh, daughter, Dania, asked if, if we might be able to hear Spirit in the Sky. Anthony said, I will try it. I'm sure he'll do it. Thank you. Remind people to read the back of your. Oh, yeah. Okay. Read the back of it. Good message, isn't it?